chapter of Acts, verses 9 to 48. The next day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on a housetop about the sixth hour to pray. And he became hungry and wanted something to eat. But while they were preparing it, he fell into a trance and saw the heavens open and something like a great sheep descending, being let down by its four corners upon the earth. In it were all kinds of animals and reptiles and birds of the air. And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, By no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice came to him again a second time, What God has made clean, do not call common. This happened three times, and the thing was taken up at once to heaven. Now while Peter was inwardly perplexed as to what the vision that he had seen might mean, behold, the men who were sent by Cornelius, having made inquiry for Simon's house, stood at the gate and called out to ask whether Simon, who was called Peter, was lodging there. And while Peter was pondering the vision, the Spirit said to him, Behold, three men are looking for you. Rise and go down and accompany them without hesitation, for I have sent them. And Peter went down to the men and said, I'm the one you're looking for. What is the reason for your coming? And they said, Cornelius, a centurion, an upright and God-fearing man, who was well spoken of by the whole Jewish nation, was directed by a holy angel to send for you to come to his house and to hear what you have to say. So he invited them in to be his guests. The next day he rose and went away with them, and some of the brothers from Joppa accompanied him. And on the following day they entered Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives and close friends. When Peter entered, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshiped him. But Peter lifted him up, saying, Stand up, I too am a man. And as he talked with them, he went in and found many persons gathered. And he said to them, You yourselves know how unlawful it is for a Jew to associate with you or to visit anyone of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any person common or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without objection. I asked them why you sent for me. And Cornelius said, four days ago, about this hour, I was praying in my house at the ninth hour, and behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing and said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard and your alms have been remembered before God. Send therefore to Joppa and ask for Simon, who is called Peter. He is lodging in the house of Simon, a tanner by the sea. So I sent for you at once and you have been kind enough to come now, therefore, we are all here in the presence of God to hear all that you have been commanded by the Lord. So Peter opened his mouth and said, Truly, I understand that God shows no partiality. But in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. As for the word that he sent to Israel, preaching good news of peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. You yourselves know what happened throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee after the baptism that John proclaimed, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all that he did both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree but God raised him on the third day and made him to appear, not to all the people, but to us who had been chosen by God as witnesses, who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to be judge of the living and the dead. To him all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. While Peter was saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word. And the believers from among the circumcised who had come with Peter were amazed.
because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on the Gentiles. For they were hearing them speaking in tongues and extolling God. Then Peter declared, Can anyone withhold water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked him to remain for some days. This is the word of the Lord. We are now in our series, going through a series on the different messages in Acts. This one in particular is quite powerful. So powerful, in fact, that between Acts uh, chapter 10 and 11, this event is repeated three times. Uh, so much so that this event really changes the way the church, the early church, viewed itself, the way they viewed others. It changes the way they even started uh, addressing who needs to hear the gospel. Uh, and as we're putting together this sermon and how we want to think about it, what to get our mind around is that a lot of change uh, is happening in this. Um, and the thought about uh, how, how close, uh, the closeness of God, really comes up in this. And I was thinking about what it means uh, to be close or to be close enough. And I remember one time when I was having a surgery on one of my knees, uh, the, I think they do this just to make sure everything's correct, but the, the, the nurse walks out and she says, is it, is it on the right knee? And I say, no, what's the left? And she laughed and said, well, it was close enough. <laughs> no. Uh, I remember when I was first uh, taken to an amusement park, and I was asked if I wanted to go on one of the big roller coaster rides, I remember standing at the entrance way, in the entrance to that ride, and saying, this is close enough for me. Um, or, and more thing more serious, I remember the first time I had my blood pressure taken when it was not right, and the doctor told me what my, my numbers were for my blood pressure, but I didn't know uh, what was good or bad. And I said, is it good or bad? She goes, it's pretty close. I'm like, close to what? That's a big difference between good or bad. And she's like, bad. And I'm like, that's important to know. Well, when we're talking about is close enough, we're talking about how close is close enough when it comes to the gospel. We're celebrating the 75th anniversary of D-Day. Uh, a D-Day when the Allies came and liberated, or began the liberation of, of Europe, especially starting with France. Imagine if they had landed on the shore and came, and they were, repel they were repelled back, and the people who were still trapped in the country said, what happened? And they said, well, we were close, right? No. Close enough doesn't count. And so when we're talking about the gospel of Christ, we're looking at today is how close is close enough. So please pray with me. Lord, thank you for this evening, this morning. Lord, we pray now. Holy Spirit, through your teachers upstairs that are children, Holy Spirit, that you would grow their faith. Lord, we pray now in this room, Holy Spirit, that through your word, uh, we would die to ourselves a little bit more awakened to you. We ask all this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. So, again, like I said, this passage really changed the scope of how they do what they do. And so we first off, the verses 1 through 9, we didn't read, but it is in your text, Verses 1 through 9, there's a man named Cornelius, who was a military leader, had lots of men under him, and he was called a God-fear, which was, there were categories of people, if you were a Jew, it means you were both, you believed in God, you were circumcised, you, were, you had a Jewish mom, that's how it worked. It was a, it was a very physical, related kingdom. Genetic. It was familiar. It was that. And Cornelius was not that, but he was called a God-fear, which means he, he really liked everything about the god of the Jews and made offerings and things in their name but he didn't go all the way he wasn't fully there as a believer and what happens to him is he has a vision and the vision says basically this God comes to him and says I have seen these offerings you've been making in my name while they are rising up I'm, I'm seeing them as far language in the vision but he's saying but they're not enough these things you're offering are not enough to get to me. I see that you want to get to me through these, but these are not enough. You're not close enough with these offerings. Something indeed must change. I'm going to have to come to you to bring about this change. So what needed to change? God had to come to him. Cornelius was trying to find God on his own, and God to come to him. That was God's vision for him. You're not there yet. Something must change. And then, at the same time, we read that Peter 
was having a vision. A very related vision to what Cornelius was having. Peter's vision is that everything is going to change. This reminds me, we're talking about the, the magic of this change. I remember the, you guys know when the, you maybe just, when, when the euro, the, the currency was introduced in Europe, uh, basically all the original countries that are part of the monetary part of the euro, um, they had to give up their currency, their national currency, and, and exchange it for the euros. And especially of all countries like uh, Italians were really upset because they thought their, their money was beautiful money. And they didn't like to have to turn it in and, and exchange it for these coins and these paper that's, that are European, the, the euros, the currency that was going to be part of these euro nations. And they didn't like it because it was, it was not, they were losing out a little bit what they were. And you had a certain date to transfer all your money. And if you did, didn't do it after the date, your money was worthless. It had to be transferred by a certain time. When we're talking about change, we're talking about change that changes everything, your perspective of everything, on that kind of magnitude. What Peter was being told, what Peter's being told in this vision even changes the way we read the Old Testament. It's because of this verse I'm able to wear probably my shirt that says bacon is meat candy. So what are we talking about? What kind of change are we talking about? Something much bigger that Peter is being told the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God is a spiritual kingdom, Peter. It is not a physical kingdom. And in the Old Testament, we were given rules and regulations to how to live as a physical kingdom. So that people would know that you are set apart not just by what you believe about God, but how you live. So people would see you're doing things differently. And they would say, why don't you wear two clothing and clothes? Why don't you do this? And they, the answer was because God wants us to be set apart. We're supposed to be set apart in heart. And what God gave us was ceremonial laws and things to do to remind us every aspect of our life that we are to be separate. And this is also part of how we showed our devotion to God. But what happened time and time again is that people forgot the hard part and focused more on the everything else. And what scripture has been proclaiming is that the everything else is based on what's going on in the heart first. That these other things don't get you to God. It's what's happening in your heart that matters first. And Peter is given a vision, and given this thing dropping down, and it's all kinds of animals, clean animals and unclean animals, things you were supposed to eat and weren't supposed to eat, and he's saying, God says to him, eat, and Peter, you see, verse says, never, Lord, would I do this. I would never do that. You're asking me to be unclean. And God says, this is what I'm asking you to do. And we see in verse 28, when Peter's interacting, so Cornelius, in his vision, Right? God is saying, you can't get to me on your own works. I'm going to have to come to you. And I'm going to come to you through this guy named Simon who's called Peter. Go find him. And Cornelius sends people to go find Simon Peter. And when he finds them, Peter is basically saying to him, oh yeah, we don't, I'm not supposed to, verse 28, I'm not supposed to interact with Gentiles, but guess what? God has just told me that everything's different now. So I need to know what it is you want me to know. Where it is you want me to go? Who am I supposed to? to speak to. God is saying that everything has changed. Something massive is changing. What God is saying, Peter, is that souls now count first and foremost. Peter had been trained by his culture and the way he understood religion at that point is that you were to look for a certain people group. And God is now saying, I need you to do something that's not natural to you. You've been trained to look racially at people, economically at people. You've been, look, you've been trained to look at people a certain way. And now I am telling you, God on high, that you must now look around, and the only thing you're going to see when you look at other people are souls. You must look past everything else that you think is true. And the only thing you're allowed to see now are souls that are in need of being saved. Remember, this is, this is pretty intense because they used to, to have the view literally that being around a Jew, just touching a Gentile would make you unclean. Going to the house of one, couldn't just gather all the people. Going to the house would make you unclean. And, and Peter is now understanding that Peter, this is hitting Peter as this is happening. God is saying you are going to go to the Gentiles. That's not what makes you unclean anymore. It's about your heart. 
Now I want you to go to a people group you almost viewed as an enemy. And you must love them as much as you're loving who used to be your own people, the Jews. God is saying you must now no longer distinguish. You must go to them. Clean and unclean isn't a thing anymore. Saved or unsaved is all that matters to the Lord. Remember I talked about the biggest sports competition considered in the world is between Madrid and Barcelona. It'd be like those two fans coming together and holding hands. It'd be like, you know, the, the way some Democrats and Republicans view each other, they, they, they can't stand each other. It'd be like them transforming, saying all I want to do is love this other group. Think about groups that we hate, we avoid, either ethnically or racially. Peter is being told to undo, under the authority of the Lord, everything he's being taught. And you must now view them now as souls needing to be saved. So Cornelius was told he's not close enough. God must come to him. And Peter is being told God is not close enough. Peter must go to them. His vision was narrow. And God is now saying you must open wide your vision. These people need to be near God too. The implications again of this verse uh, cannot be one of the one of the. Um, there's a side note here. I put on my notes. This is a side note, so I'm not rambling. Um, uh, that th this verse is so significant because the New Testament teaches us how to read the Old Testament. And a lot of times, people like to say to to Christians, "Well, who are you to judge? Who are you to tell me what to follow and not to follow?" The Old Testament says you should not wear clothing made of two things, and you can't do this, and you're saying you can't. Who are you to judge? Who are you to tell me what we can and can't do? It's all what we want to do. Well, we see in Scripture itself, God telling us how to read the Old Testament. We read the Old Testament through the work of Jesus Christ. The ceremonial laws are no longer necessary because there is no physical kingdom that God is trying to extend. It's not geographical. It's not based in Jerusalem. The kingdom God is trying to expand is spiritual. So what we're to focus on is the heart and the soul. So Christ says we hold, we still hold tight to the Ten Commandments because those are about the heart. But the ceremonial laws, those types of rules and regulations are no longer necessary because what sets us apart now is God's holiness, His love, His righteousness in our hearts. And imagine how hard that's for Peter. Everything in his life was to go and act a certain way. And in the moment's notice, he's being told to undo everything he's ever learned. Under the authority of Christ, again, Peter's not understanding what it means to follow the Lord, and that everything has been pointing to Christ. Galatians 3.28, Paul read in his confession. This is what it's screaming. Again, now because of the cross, there is no, when it comes to salvation, whether you're a Jew or a Greek, it doesn't matter what country or nationality you're from. It doesn't matter what family you're from. Slave or free, that's also, also economic, right? It doesn't matter where you are. We're all souls in need of a Savior. How hard of it would it be for us when you look at a crowd, when you go into a room of people different than yourself, to only see souls in need of saving. It is impossible outside of the work of the Spirit in your heart, but that is what Christ is calling us to do. He's telling Peter that's what you need to do. That calls on us. And so they come together in verse 33. The next part is so Cornelius begins this vision, Peter's begins this vision, and they're now coming together. Peter's been told, you've got to go talk to somebody. Cornelius has said, you need to get someone to come talk to you. And the parties are meeting together. Now, uh, what does remind how Cornelius responds to him in verse 33? Now, uh, some of you aren't as blessed to have uh, arm care like I have arm hair. And when I'm having, uh, whenever I'm having a doctor's visit, a needle or anything, my first thought isn't, I'm so glad I'm getting a shot. I'm so glad they're, they're taking care of it. My first thought is, that's going to hurt coming off. Doesn't matter. It's always my first thought. That's just going to hurt. Doesn't matter what they're saving me from. I'm like, that's going to hurt when we rip it off. And the only solution for me is just rip it off hard. And some of you, when it comes to receiving bad information, you're like that. You're like, just tell me what it is, right? And for some of you, you're like, I need you to sugarcoat it. Like, you know, let's take me out to dinner and then tell me the bad news, right? Uh, 
And Cornelius is basically says, listen, God's giving me a vision. God's giving you a vision. Just lay it on me. This is what he wants. Peter, under the same kind of philosophy, some of you, when you need to share bad news, some of us are so bad news avoidance that we, we surround it with so much like fluff that when you share the bad news, people are like, I don't even know what you just said. <laughs> right? Peter's like, all right, I'm going to go right to the point. This particular instance, how Peter's wanted to remind you of how I didn't do it. Uh, I was uh, on a, a trip in Peru, and a college student had been assigned to work with our group as we were doing hotels and doing every ministry and stuff. She wasn't a Christian, but she was uh, working with the hotel that we were being a part of, and so she was seeing us as we were kind of moving in and moving out and doing stuff, and she went with us on one of our, just our, like one little random sightseeing day, and she decided just to come with us. She had the day off too, and the translator had been working with us, came up to me, and the translator said, Chris, she, she wants to hear the message. And I said, she wants to hear about, you know, the gospel of Christ? And she said, yes. I was like, how exciting. So we sat down, and for five minutes I'm talking, and the translator, <laughs> she goes, she's like, she tells the, the woman, hold on a second, she turns to me and she goes, Chris, could you just get to the point? <laughs> <laughs> I'm tired of translating for you. Could you just tell her she needs Jesus? And I was like, you need Jesus. And that was it. <laughs> Peter gets right to the point. Now, what's so phenomenal here is the rumor that Peter, just prior to this, wouldn't have been seen talking to them. Would have viewed them. He could he viewed his righteousness. At this point, Peter, if you were going to this town and saw them in their house, Peter would have felt good about the fact that he avoided them and went somewhere else. This is where he was just moments before this. And now, under the authority of God, saying, Peter, you've got to look at them differently. Peter's Stepping out in faith. And so he, the guy's like, tell me. And Peter's like, I'm going to tell you. And so this is what he tells them. And this is where he starts. Knowing that these, this guy's a god fear, he kind of knows about it, but knowing they're Gentiles, look at he's he got to imagine at the same time he's thinking, I don't know what these people are like. I don't know what food they eat. I don't know what jokes they tell. I don't know what they look like when they, you know, when they get up in the morning. It's, they're so weird. They're, they're Gentiles. I don't have anything to do with them. And now I'm sharing with them the most important message. So he... He, I think he, what he does is reduce down to the most important parts. Right? We've seen where Peter, and I mean, sorry, he starts off with all the history of Abraham and everything else, but here he skips all that. He's like, this is what you have. So I break this part down into four verses. You could do it in other ones, but four parts of this. I think the first one is this. Peter basically saying, change has come. This is how we need to get closer to God, Cornelius. This is how you get closer to God. Part one, verses 34 and 35. Basically, who is the gospel for? Peter says, truly I understand now. It's, again, his, his mind is exploding. His vision is getting bigger. Who is it for? Anyone. Everyone. So the first thing he says is that who needs to hear the message of God? And Peter, again, can I imagine Peter saying this literally? I finally understand now. Everybody needs to hear the message of God. Because before that, Peter was thinking only a few people should hear the message of God. And so he's basically saying we're all here. Everyone in this room should hear it. In verse 36 and, uh, to 38, I think he goes very logically. So, who is the gospel for? It's for anyone. What is the gospel? And Peter boils down the gospel to basically, Christ is Lord, and only through him will you find peace. The word for peace here is also the, the Jewish word, the Hebrew word for shalom. What he's saying is only through Christ, only through Christ. And shalom is about an outward peace and an inward peace. And he's saying, only through Christ, only through Christ, will you find peace. That's the gospel message. Again, Cornelius was trying to find his own way there. And Peter's saying, it is only in Christ you will find your peace in this life and in the next. And then, 39, Peter's been saying, so who are we? And Peter is saying, we are witnesses. We are witnesses to this Christ who died and rose again. Christ controls death and life. Christ is our way to eternity. We are witnesses. Again, Cornelius is part of saying, is, Peter, you have a message. Why are you here, Peter? And Peter is saying, I'm here. I'm here. Because we literally ate with the risen Christ. 
And it is that Christ you will find peace in this life and in the next to come. You will find peace from trying to get to God on your own efforts, your own morality. You will find peace with God through Jesus Christ. And the last point Peter makes is in verse 43. So what does this mean? It means salvation. What does all this mean? It means Cornelius, salvation has come to you. You couldn't get your way there, but through Christ, salvation has come to you. To you. This peace has come to you. To know a peace that can withstand the worst experiences in life. A peace that can overshadow them. A peace that can give you confidence about your hope and your future has come through Christ. So their response, very quickly, how do they respond? What I call a mini Pentecost. Remember at Pentecost, we read the beginning of Acts, is that the Holy Spirit came down and all those who had gathered, the apostles, every disciples who gathered, started speaking the gospel in the languages of everyone there. So all the Jews who were there and gathered were hearing it. And now what we're seeing is the same thing, but it's all Gentiles in the room. All the Gentiles and all the non-Jewish people are now proclaiming God in their own languages, their own native tongue. Remember, Cornelius had called a whole bunch of people together. And now they're all shouting and they're all talking about God has come. The God that they couldn't kind of get to. Remember, it was a pluralistic society. They were all trying to find their way. And now they hear that Christ has come to them. Salvation has come to them. And the Holy Spirit, it says, this is a slightly longer message Peter gives. This is the summation of it. And it says, like, while Peter was talking, people were like, we get to the end. The Spirit comes upon them, and they're proclaiming, they're talking, they're shouting, speaking in their different languages to the other people in the room about who God is. And imagine Peter seeing what happened the first Pentecost and now seeing what I'm calling him the mini Pentecost and imagine what we're going through his mind realizing that Christ really did die to save souls from every nation, tribe, and tongue. So what is Peter's response? Peter's response is let's why shouldn't we be baptized? I mean, just so you understand the magnitude of this, baptism, baptism is a sacrament, a sign and a seal that you are part of God's covenantal community. And so Peter, who viewed himself as a Jew, was only reaching Jews, and has been told just shortly before this, Peter, expand your vision. Everyone needs Christ. And now he's with a room full of people he wouldn't have associated with. They've all come to faith in Christ. And so what does Peter do? He says, it's time for us to become one spiritual community. And he says, let's all get baptized. Let's baptize everyone. Which is Peter's way of saying we are all part of a new family. Imagine that. Moments before, people would have people that Peter would have viewed as people who made him dirty. He's now saying, you are my brothers and sisters. That's the power of the gospel. That's what it means for God to come near to you. So I just end with this thought. What part of your vision of God needs to be refined because you're not close enough? As you draw near to Christ, he expands your view of others. He expands your view of grace. He expands your view of how much you need him. Remember, when it comes to your salvation, your eternal salvation, clothes won't cut it. Imagine if you had cancer and you went to your surgeon afterwards who were removing it and said, we came close to getting it all out. <laughs> right? Imagine if you're on your wedding day and you're looking at your spouse saying, I love you. You're like, I, I love you almost as much. No. When it comes to your salvation, close isn't enough. You need the presence of Jesus Christ himself. We need Jesus Christ in no other name. And that's what he does for us on the cross. And that's what Peter is proclaiming, and that's what Cornelius received. Christ came to me. Please pray with me. Lord, it is impossible and hard to change people's hearts and minds. Lord, help us to stop trying to do that. Lord, help us to distrust in you and the power of your salvation.
people of God. We are not won over by words. We are won over by the love and power of the Holy Spirit. Lord, help us to see that we need you near us. We need you to dwell within us. Lord, help us to view everything differently because of you, because you came to us. Thank you. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Please stand for our final song.